If you were with us in the last video lecture, you witnessed the election of Ronald Reagan. And with the, um, with the election of Reagan, you see the Reagan Revolution. And when we established what we meant by that was that our politics are becoming more conservative, more clear-cut conservative, and more groups are beginning to warm up to this concept of limited government, and certainly that's the essence of the Reagan Revolution. You know, or you should know by now, that on the campaign trail in 1980, Reagan vowed to um, reign in the size of government. He vowed to cut wasteful, wasteful spending, downsize government agencies that uh, he felt that he could get away with downsizing. Um, there is this notion that uh, an advisor, or at least somebody that uh, consulted the Reagan administration from time to time, would refer to as starving the beast. Now, people within this administration were smart enough to understand that politics were cyclical and, you know, there was, you, there, there, you're not going to have a dominating presence in American politics forever, right? The idea being, starve the amount of money that is going into some of these government programs, and uh, when and if the opposition ever gets back into power, and there's an economic hiccup, um, you can justify cutting that government at the same time. The idea being, even when you're not in charge, you'll at least still have a talking point when it comes to uh, the agenda that you want to pursue, which of course is smaller government. In the middle of all of this, you see a labor management dispute involving PATCO. The workers that comprised PATCO were the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization. Now, these are the people that sit in the uh, control tower and tell your pilot it's okay to take off or give me a few minutes before you land, clear some traffic, that sort of thing. And in 1980 into 81, PATCO had walked off on strike. They claimed that they want better working conditions, and, and, and including shorter work days, uh, so that they could rest. They wanted more pay for the uh, jobs that they performed so that they wouldn't have to worry about money and moonlighting and places to make ends meet. And um, what Reagan is going to say to these people is that they were essentially violating uh, a, an antitrust act which forbade organizations, including unions, from interfering with interstate travel. And certainly air travel would have qualified as, as such in the, in the early 1980s. Um, Reagan gave Patco an ultimatum. You either go back to work or I will fire all of you and I will hire replacement workers. Now you have to understand where Patco is coming from in the decision that they ultimately make. They're not people that worked in Homestead Steel. Uh, they're not people that worked for the Pullman Company that we were talking about the early part of the 20th century. These are very highly skilled workers and they're not hanging out in every street corner. Understand that if the government were to fire these people and then rehire their replacements, that is a big, big um, financial expense. And not only is it a financial expense, there's a risk involved there. If you fire all of these experts and then planes start dropping out of the sky, there's a pretty good chance that the American people are going to hold you accountable. So you can understand where Patco is coming from when they called the bluff of the Reagan administration. Only Reagan wasn't really bluffing. He did, in fact, fire all of them. He then went on to hire their replacements, retrain them in a very quick turnaround time. And ultimately, we don't have planes falling out of the sky. PATCO is an enormous defeat for not just the professional air traffic controllers, but unions, generally speaking. You have to understand why. What this signaled to corporate America is that the federal government was willing to go to great, great lengths and take pretty big risks when it comes to ridding itself of unions. And essentially what was good for the Reagan administration would be perceived as being good for corporate America. In other words, if, if, if you want to get rid of your unions, now is as good of a time as any to do so. If you're following along on the PowerPoint with me, you can see uh, a graph that uh, illustrates union membership over the second half of the 20th century and into the early 21st century. And you can see that it peaks in the uh, mid-1950s with just over 32% of the private workforce belonging to a union. I'm not talking about teachers or firemen or police officers or something. Anyway, um, and then it's a steady decline throughout the second half of the 20th century. 
We know that uh, the 1970s economic dip probably played a pretty big role in this, but you really begin to see unionism falling like a stone in the early 1980s. Part of the reason that historians think that this is the case is the Reagan administration signaled um, a changing of the guard, so to speak, when it comes to the way that it was going to enforce rules involving unionism. Again, if the Reagan administration is ridding itself of unions within its uh, various institutions, uh, now is as good of a time as any if you're thinking about getting rid of unions. And, and certainly that's what you see over the course of the second half of the 20th century. Um, the next thing that I'd like to talk to you about would be what historians refer to as Reaganism. Okay? Now, a Reaganism can mean anything from smaller forms of government to... Uh, ending governmental programs that uh, were, were, were doing a good bit of good, or at least to those people that they serve, were doing a good bit of good in American life. Um, one good example of a Reaganism would be his decision to cut the ERA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Reagan publicly proclaimed that he felt that the ERA was a left-wing cult, and so when he inherited the presidency, he appoints a guy that thought a lot like he did to lead it. If you don't really believe in the work that you're doing, there's a very good chance that you're not going to do the greatest of work. And, and certainly you begin to see environmentalism being rolled back during the Reagan years. Reagan also proclaimed that he felt that, um, that the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act were a mistake. What you're looking at there on the PowerPoint slide with me is Reagan giving his first um, stop on the uh, campaign tour of 1980. And Neshoba County, Mississippi, was in um, it was the, the, the largest city in Neshoba County was Philadelphia, Mississippi. And if you recall, back in the mid 1960s, that was the site those three civil rights workers uh, were unearthed. They had uh, had a massive FBI manhunt looking for their whereabouts. And in the summer of 1964, we finally come to the realization that they've been murdered. That's where their bodies were found. You have to understand that. There's, you know, there's context here, right? That if you were to look up Philadelphia, Mississippi, that's probably really the only thing that you'd be able to find. And so going in front of a crowd in that part of Mississippi and proclaiming these two big accomplishments when it comes to civil rights reform as mistakes, as an infringement upon states' rights, um, once again, there's a little bit of coding, uh, a dog whistle politics that are going on here, right? That if you believe in uh, limited government and you want that to believe, I'm not going to tell you what you have to do vis-a-vis -vis civil rights, then certainly that's what it means. I don't know if you remember me saying this, but um, I had men made mention that Reagan did not apologize for his religiosity. And he publicly proclaimed that he could not condone what he referred to as an alternative lifestyle. At the end of the 1960s, uh, gays and lesbians had uh, organized themselves into a political minority and began to mobilize for rights for people of that variety. Probably the more important element of this is going to result in same-sex marriage, but this is what Reagan meant when he referred to this as an alternative lifestyle, as if being gay, homosexual, was ultimately a choice. Um, you might be pretty clear in that Reagan was going to do very little as far as providing rights and protection for people of that variety during his years in the White House. That's not to say that people did not mobilize for their rights in the LGBT community. It's not that much different than heterosexuality, um, especially sex outside of wedlock, but you have to understand that up until the 1960s, very few people talked about this issue. Right. Furthermore, for all intents and purposes, it was basically gay, uh, illegal to be gay in, in the United States. Um, our first real sort of introduction to this demographic of Americans is going to come via New York City in 1969. The New York Police Department is going to raid a dive, a hole-in-the-wall bar called the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village, New York. And when they raided it, they were pretty much arresting the people on the inside because it was illegal to run in an organization like a bar or a club or something like that variety that, that catered especially to people of that variety. 
So all of these individuals on the inside were, um, were being arrested basically for indecent uh, behavior or what was considered to be dis indecent behavior at, by those standards, and they began to push back. And basically what this was, was a pushback against the police. And all of a sudden, this Stonewall riot is going to make news from coast to coast, and it's going to bring about attention to this issue in American life. Now, you have to understand how people of the gay, lesbian, transgendered variety were seen uh, by mainstream America at that particular moment. As a matter of fact, it was well into 1973 that the American Psychiatric Association described homosexuality as a mental disorder. Um, in 1977, there was a campaign, especially in Florida, that was uh, come to be known as Save Our Children. And what this campaign drove at is the, the idea that we probably should not have people of the gay, lesbian variety uh, in front of American classrooms teaching our children. You do have a few bright spots, including Dade County, Florida, Miami, um, that managed to get a law on the books that made it a crime, at least a local crime, to take sexual orientation into consideration when it comes to hiring or promotion. But for all intents and purposes, um, it is a really difficult thing to be homosexual in America um, during this time period. One of the people that really brings this matter to the fore is the guy that you're looking at on the screen there with me, uh, America's first openly gay politician, a guy by the name of Harvey Milk. Okay? In 1978, Harvey Milk is going to successfully run for the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, City Council. What he's able to do is he's able to get several anti-discrimination laws on the books in San Francisco. And so if you've ever wondered why San Francisco seems to be sort of taking the lead on many of these issues, um, Harvey Milk and his political career is probably a very good safe bet in terms of why. By 1980, he is probably the leading spokesman for civil rights of the LGBT community variety. As a matter of fact, by 1979, he is instrumental in the National March on Washington for gay and lesbian rights. But once again, guys, you got to know what he's up against. Um, Proposition 6 in California uh, proposed that gays and lesbians not only be barred from this, the, the institution of education, public education, but all public sector work. And so you do really begin to see this whole issue of civil rights, um, you know, civil rights, civil liberties that, that, are, that are kind of expanding in American life in the second half of the 20th century. And certainly Harvey Milk is a very good example of that. But the real big issue that I need you to understand about the Reagan administration is going to be his approach to getting the economy back up and running again. Much like Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Ronald Reagan inherited a very sluggish economy, okay? And what Franklin Roosevelt did to get that economy going is try to increase the demand side of the economy, right? Put money in average, ordinary American hands, people like me and you. Get them spending money again. When they spend money, they'll create demand, and the only way that big business will have to meet those growing demands would be to hire more workers, right? Upwardly cyclical. Um, Reagan has an idea that's really not that much different, except he doesn't want to focus on the supply uh, on the on the demand side. He wants to focus on the supply side. What Reagan proposed was fewer taxes. He proposed a 10% across the board income tax reduction. The theory being that if Americans were able to hold on to some more of their hard-earned paychecks, they would put that money back into the American economy. Reagan is beginning to call this approach to, um, to economic policy trickle-down economics. And the whole concept behind trickle-down economics is going to be cut taxes for people at the very top end of the, um, uh, of the economy. Now, of course, on paper, everybody qualified for a little bit of tax cut, but really focus on wealthier Americans and corporations. The theory being those wealthy Americans and corporations would have more disposable income to build new factories and invest in research and hire more workers and expand their production capabilities, um, generally speaking. Trickle-down economics is eventually going to become known as Reaganomics. 
And, um, you know, the idea is it's a leap of faith, right? What you're hoping that Americans are going to do is uh, pay that money forward and put it right back into the American economy. But if you know anything about economics, they have a few other choices in addition to paying it forward. One individual that was no big fan of Reaganomics was the white-haired gentleman that you're looking at laughing with the president at the bottom of the screen there. That is the liberal speaker of the House, a man from Massachusetts by the name of Tip O'Neill. Tip O'Neill referred to Reaganomics as welfare for the rich. If you make more than $50,000, which I realize seems very middle-classy by our standards, but keep in mind it's the early 1980s, if you make more than $50,000, then you love Reaganomics, right? If you make less than $50,000, get ready to resign yourself to a lower standard of living because essential government programs are going to be cut because we no longer ha have that same sort of revenue coming in. Reagan is able to defeat Tip O'Neill, and he's able to get that 10% reduction of income taxes across the board a reality. He's able to get his tax cuts. The problem is he still has essential programs that he can't cut. I mean, let's be honest here. Um, if you're going to cut the amount of money that you've got coming in, theoretically, you have to cut the amount of money uh, that you're spending. I mean, it's no different than simple home economics, right? You lose your job, you're probably going to tighten your belt. It makes sense, right? The problem is, just like me and you, there's certain things that you can't um, that you can't cut. You you can't cut your mortgage payment. You can't cut your grocery bill. I mean, you can shrink them in various ways, but um, you, you can't just dispense with them altogether. Reagan still has to support the military. As a matter of fact, one of the biggest reasons that he had such a problem balancing the budget was massive amounts of military spending. You'll see what I mean in the next lecture. But in any case, there are other essential programs that Ronald Reagan didn't dare touch, right? Social Security, wildly popular with the American people, right? Some of whom were still around to remember the horrors and the ravages of the Great Depression. Medicare, Medicaid, um, government programs of health insurance designed to bring health care to people that couldn't afford to buy it or were too old to buy it through conventional methods. These are the essential programs that I'm talking about. And so if that money's not there in the form of tax revenue, that the only other way that you have to shore things up is to borrow it. And so what you begin to see are massive budget deficits. I don't mean debt, right? What I mean are deficits. What I want you to understand about a deficit is that this is a shortfall of money, um, money that you need to spend. In other words, you, you need to get to right here at the end of the month in terms of the amount of money that you make. The problem is you've only gotten to like right here, right? What you've got from here to here is your deficit. It's the amount of money that you still need to raise, find somewhere, because if you don't, there's certain programs that you have to have that you're not going to be able to afford. And of course, where we're going to get the money for this is we're going to finance it. We're going to borrow it. And so you begin to see these budget deficits that are beginning to explode during the early Reagan years. By 1982, you're beginning to see them approach the same level of GDP. The amount of goods and services that the American economy produced in one year was almost equivalent to the shortfall that we're just not bringing in the form of revenue. And Reagan's going to pay a political price for this. In 1982, the Democrats are going to retake Congress. In other words, Reagan's going to be up against it when it comes to getting more and more of his legislation passed through, and the tax cuts are a big reason why. And at that point, Reagan realized that the jig was up. He invited Tip O'Neill over to the White House. The two of them had a walk on the White House lawn, and, and it was at that point that Reagan agreed to raise taxes on the very wealthy. Not only did Reagan agree to raise taxes, he raised them 11 times throughout his presidency. And he also raised the debt ceiling, the amount of money Congress was able to borrow for bills that we'd already run up. We've got a very, shall we say, misguided understanding of who Ronald Reagan was and if we, he was here in the 21st century, how he would approach our, our current predicaments, right? In any case, um, th this is Reaganomics in a nutshell. It's a mixed bag, right? You can think of it this way. The rich got richer, the poor got poorer, and the national debt expanded. But the economy does seem to turn around. And by 1984, when Reagan is running for re-election, 
um, his slogan was, it's morning again in America. In other words, the economy has turned the corner and it's a new day in the United States and all of that ugliness and nastiness is behind us. 70s, late 60s, it's all behind us. And for, you know, uh, the restored economy, Reagan championed these economic heroes of the 1980s. The man on Time Magazine that you're looking at at the top of the screen there, that would be Lee Iacocca, who's going to take over a very struggling American, econ uh, American uh, corporation, the Chrysler Corporation, completely retool it, reinvent it, turn it around to the, to the point where Chrysler comes roaring back. My guess is you probably have seen that individual at the bottom of the screen down there, right? It's Donald Trump. And the industry that's going to make Donald Trump um, famous is going to be real estate, real estate in New York City in particular. And what Donald Trump is really going to do is he's really going to buy up dilapidated properties in New York and rebuild them with the best of the best of the best and charge really exorbitant rates for staying there, right, or living there, right? I'm not saying that this is good or bad or it's anything, but what I am saying is your average ordinary uh, Americans can no longer afford to stay in New York City. Before Donald Trump came along in the mid-1970s, um, average ordinary Americans could afford to live in New York, right? Uh, the city implemented what was known as rent control and told landlords this is the maximum amount of rent that you can charge, and uh, people um, were, were forced to stay beneath that. Once Trump starts buying up all of this property and begins retooling it, um, property values go up, but to get that money back, he needs to charge a lot of money for staying there or living there. And what that means is rent control is going to have to go away. And if you've been to New York, you'll be able to tell me it's a very, very expensive place to live. But if you ask me, the real economic heroes are not human beings as much as they are computers. Now, if you're looking at that screen there, I'm sure that looks like a dinosaur, but I'm telling you something. Once upon a time, that was considered to be cutting-edge technology. The computer. What the computer revolution is going to do is going to be able, to, we're going to be able, as a workforce, to do a lot, lot more with a lot, lot less. Computers had existed in some form or fashion, really, since the World War II years. The only issue was they were massive. They were huge. They took up entire rooms. The combination of the transistor um, and the integrated circuit would ultimately lead to what we call the microprocessor, which would allow computers to become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller to the point by the 1980s, you could plop one of these things on your desk. And with a computer, I mean, even th think about this from somebody just like a student, right? Um, just think about somebody that's growing up in the late 1970s that is clack, clack, clacking away this uh, history essay that they've got that's due that's at the end of the week. If you mess something up, you got to start all over from scratch. Enter into our conversation a, micro, uh, a, 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 a word processor, and now all you need to do is hit backspace, backspace, backspace. And you can see pretty quickly how this is going to fuel the American economy, right? We're going to become more productive. And over the course of the 1980s and the 1990s, computers would continue to evolve and really allow the American workforce to do more with less. And in addition to that, they're going to create a new demand for computer products in and of themselves, right? You got to ask yourself, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? I'll come back to that thing in just a minute. For right now, guys, I want to talk to you about the election in 1984. In 1984, the Democrats are going to nominate a guy from Minnesota by the name of Walter Mondale. And he was your prototypical liberal, you know, up-and-coming New Deal Democrat, uh, really forged in the, uh, in the mid to late 1960s. That's when he's really going to cut his political teeth. And he's going to nominate, at that point in time, the first ever female vice presidential candidate. That uh, lady that you're seeing wave alongside him is Geraldine Ferraro. And Reagan is absolutely going to mop the floor with Mondale and Ferraro. 1984 is an absolute massive landslide of a re-election. Um, as you might imagine, Mondale is from Minnesota because Minnesota is the only blue state on that map up there. Technically, he also won the District of Columbia, but that was nowhere near even close to making it competitive, uh, let alone giving him a real opportunity to win the White House. 
What the election of 1984 demonstrates is more of the Reagan revolution. We are very clearly a right of center country. The idea involving domestic politics when it comes to taxes, uh, when it comes to government agencies, when it comes to the way that we begin to think about government and the role that it plays in American life, it is very clearly of the conservative variety. Okay. But the long-term impact of Reaganomics and Reaganism is going to be a very complicated issue. American corporations are increasingly going to become international organizations. Now, some might say that they always were such. Ford Motor, for example, not only sold its products throughout the world, but um, produced its products throughout the world as well, including key components of its products. The fact of the matter is, though, from the 1970s forward, you begin to see the problem that we now call offshore production, outsourcing. You begin to see more and more American manufacturing corporations moving their companies not only within the United States, but eventually overseas. And the simple fact of the matter is, it's got everything to do with money. It's a lot less expensive to produce in Central America, in Eastern Europe, in, in, in Eastern Asia, throughout other parts of the world where labor costs are much, much lighter, environmental standards are far less rigorous, and um, you don't have the same sort of rules and regulations that you do here in these United States. And Reagan was asked to comment on this, and he said that uh, the American economy was transitioning and we were becoming a service economy, right? Well, the service economy, yeah, it's all fine and well. Accountants preserve, uh, perform a service. Um, teachers perform a service. Um, people like uh, stockbrokers, they, they perform a service. But the fact of the matter is, th those are professions, and those are, those are occupations that you're going to need some qualifications for, typically a college degree. And there are also things that you only need so many of them. Right? You're going to need a lot more people that are taking orders at fast food restaurants, if you catch what I'm trying to say here, than you are working at places like Prudential or Merrill Lynch. Right? You'll see what I'm talking about once we get to the 1990s. But for right now, um, there's another relatively troubling um, issue on the horizon. And um, much of that has to do with our continued uh, ballooning deficits. Over the course of the 1980s, if you're following along in that um, um, PowerPoint graph with me, you're seeing our debt grow increasingly and steadily, right? Especially over the course of the 1980s. Now, think back to the 1920s for a second. When you think Great Depression, you don't blame Warren Harding. When you think of the Great Depression, you don't blame Calvin Coolidge. You blame Herbert Hoover. Because Herbert Hoover was in the White House at the time that the economy crashed. And for good, better, or worse, that's the way that it's going to work. Ronald Reagan is going to go home to California in 1989, and he's going to be nowhere to be found in 1992 when the economy flies off of a cliff. And as you're going to find out, we're going to blame the guy in the White House at the time uh, when the economy does this nosedive. Now, about that guy. Throughout the Reagan years, from 80 to 88, the guy that was serving as Ronald Reagan's vice president, if you're looking at the screen there, that'd be George Herbert Walker Bush of Texas. And Bush is really going to coattail on Ronald Reagan's um, um, accomplishments, if you want to call them that, his merits, if you want to call them that. And in 1988, he's going to run uh, for president. And in a lot of ways, Bush's campaign is going to mirror that of Ronald Reagan's um, time as president. He's got a campaign on low taxes, a strong military, strong foreign policy, and continuation of relatively conservative policies broadly defined. The guy that he's going to run against is a liberal governor from Massachusetts by the name of Michael Dukakis. And once again, if you're looking at that map, well, it's a pretty red map, and it does demonstrate that we're a very conservative country. Maybe not very conservative, but we're a, very, we're a conservative country by 1988. Bush's election is going to complete the Reagan dynasty. It's not very often that things of that variety happen, that you see back-to-back-to-back uh, -to -back -to -back Republican administrations. But certainly in the 1980s, you see exactly that. And on the campaign trail, this, this might not seem all that relevant, but believe me, you're going to hear it again. Um, George Bush made a promise to the American people. 
he used to say, read my lips, no new taxes. That if you elect me, then I will, I will enact policies that are very similar to Ronald Reagan's policies involving taxation. Okay? Now, this is not really going to seem to be that big of a deal in 1988 or 1989, or really not until 1992. But in 1992, the economy is going to come crashing down. And again, I think you know who we're going to blame for that, that economic downturn. You'll see what I mean once we get to the early 1990s. For right now, I want to turn our attention to American foreign policy. I'll see you next time.